All right, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Say hello, everybody that's here. And hello to you that are watching from home, especially those that are sick. We have still quite a few that are sick in our congregation. Just want you to know we've been praying for you. We really have. When we say we're praying for you, we really mean it. And we believe in the power of God. Before I get started, I want to give a special shout out to D, Pastor D, who, as of about three or four minutes ago, it looked like our computer completely crashed and we were not going to be able to live stream, and, and now here we are. <laughs> so, yay, D. Uh, you did it, sister. Appreciate it. Uh, let's open it in prayer, please. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you, Father, for your word that we're about to dive into. We thank you, God, that it's not anybody else's word. It's not something that we have to formulate ourselves. It's not anything really that we bring to the table. We ourselves just come as we are. We open your word, God. We dive in, and your Holy Spirit does the rest. Indeed, we pray that you would do that tonight, God. We want to be changed by your word. We want to be affected by your word. We want to be um, challenged by your word. We want to be even rebuked, God, where necessary by your word. We want to be set straight, in other words, and uh, God, just set us straight tonight. I pray, God, for each person, several people, Lord, right now that are dealing with sickness of different kinds. I just pray right now a special touch for them, Lord. Strengthen their bodies. Pray a blessing in their minds, their emotions, and their spirit. Just give them a holistic healing, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And again, be with us tonight as we dive in. in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, we are in the second uh, installment, as it were, of the Book of Romans study. I hope that you enjoyed last week. Uh, we gave some fast facts last week. Uh, I won't go into those. They're in your notes uh, if you want to look back to get the setting. Uh, we did get through verse 7 of chapter 1 last week, which was basically Paul's greeting. Uh, and I just want to encourage you as we continue to read the Book of Romans, uh, just notice that we're going to see richness, a richness of Christian doctrine. I mean, the book of Romans is chock full of Christian, good Christian doctrine. And we want to look also for takeaways for ourselves. We want to ask questions. Do I believe God gave his son? Do I believe the gospel message in its entirety? Do I believe God will work all things for our good? All things, that is. Not some things, all things. The big things, the small things. We want to ask personal questions. Can I really trust him in my trials? I mean, that's a good question. Is he really using my trial to produce something good in my life? That's a good question. Will we really see victory in our lives? Um, that's making it real, guys. When you're reading the Word, that's really making it real. Personalize it and look at it from the standpoint of what it's saying to you. Let's pick up tonight in verse 8 of Romans 1, and here we go. Verse 8 says, first, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, uh, the way may be open for me to come to you. Paul is known for long run-on sentences. <laughs> We're going to see that. Colons, semicolons, uh, commas. Um, that's one of his trademarks. Uh, verse 11, I long to see you that, so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you but I've been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live 
by faith. So that's as far as we will go tonight, Lord willing, and we're going to just stop right there and unpack some of this before we go further. Let's look at verse 8. Start off with verse 8. It says, First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. So remember, Paul has never met them, yet he is thanking God for them. Did you notice that? Did you know that that is a good way to pray for someone? (laughs) Check this out. When praying for someone, it is always good to give thanks for them. I say that because oftentimes we don't know how to pray. I've heard people say that. I, Pastor, I've tried to pray. I don't even know what to say. Or, or you're praying for someone. How do I pray for that person? I don't, well, how about, how about you start by thanking God for them? That's a good one. You can pray that for me. Thank God for our pastor. I appreciate that. You know, it, it, you know, start with giving thanks for them. Thank you, Lord, that you put so-and-so in my life. Thank you, God, that your hands are all over them. Thank you for what you've done for them, Lord. Thank you for what their life means, Lord. Thank you for the friendship I have with them. Thank you for their faith in you. You know, that's a good thing to do. Um, so that's a good place to start. It's always good to start by giving thanks. Did, have you noticed that? <laughs> uh, that's never, you can never go wrong by giving thanks in your prayer. And now notice what he says. He says, because your faith is being reported all over the world. Why was it being reported all over the world? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, all faith is great. I mean, we rejoice when we hear about the Spirit moving in certain areas, right? Uh, But what makes this special? I believe, guys, there are two things that are going on in this scene here. First of all, we said last week that this, this church in Rome, if you recall, they had no formal training, right? No denominational affiliation, no special funding by a mega church. They were simply Roman believers who were at Pentecost, right? And they caught that fire and took it back with them and started a church. And apparently that church was flourishing. It was Jews who would stand to reason that went to Pentecost. That's what the Pentecost was. It was a Jewish festival. But the Roman church was mostly Gentiles. So it stands to reason that that fire came back to a Gentile region like Rome and caught fire. It's awesome. This, again, that, guys, this shows the dynamic nature of the gospel. It can't be stopped. That's such an important point that I made last week, and I want to point out again, guys, the gospel doesn't need embellishing. You don't have to worry about, you know, I don't know, i got to talk convincingly, i got to talk these people in. No, you put the gospel out there and let it do the rest. <laughs> we'll get into that in a minute. It's the power. It has power. It can't be stopped. All we are called to do is just simply spread the good news. <laughs> Tell your neighbors about Jesus. It's not your responsibility for what they do with it, right? Be Jesus to a lost world. Let him pick up the pieces. Let him uh, handle the, the, the harvest. It's his harvest anyway, by the way. Okay, so that's one point. Secondly, again, I'm asking the question, why did the whole world, why had the whole world heard about this? We need to remember the setting. What is the setting of the book of Romans? Rome, (laughs) of all places, man. I mean, it's like the center of debauchery, right? The capital of the Roman Empire, right? Can you just imagine the setting? It was a pagan stronghold, to say the least. I can only imagine the culture that was around them. But yet, right in the middle of all of that, the church was flourishing. Isn't that awesome? So I just, I just proposed that the early Roman church flourished in the middle of the most depraved society in existence at the time. <laughs> That's another reason why the, whole, the, the word had spread. Hey, did you hear about that church in Rome? Rome? Are you kidding me? There's a church in Rome of all places? You know, I mean, what's the equivalent of that today? You know, I mean, we hear about, we hear about the gospel spreading in places like San Francisco, you know, or, uh, yeah, I mean, some of these hotbeds for, for just, uh, I mean, I remember years ago, years and years ago, my dad and several here, I think Twyla, uh, maybe some others went to a big prayer conference up there in San Francisco. And, I mean, they, the Satan worshipers and uh, enemies of God all came out in droves, and we're all standing outside praying, 
and to Satan against what was going on inside this convention center. And there were some powerful stories that came out of that. I remember one of the leaders in the Satan movement got saved at that. <laughs> right in the middle of all that craziness. That's the power of the gospel, amen? So don't get discouraged about what you see going on in our culture, guys. I know it's so easy to get discouraged on how things are changing so rapidly uh, before us. Um, I, I was just thinking, honestly, I was just thinking just this afternoon about our sensibilities and, you know, and, and uh, the things that we feel comfortable with in this, in this nation and the, the moral, uh, some of the moral uh, uh, truths that we grew up with, you know, and honor your nation, honor God, honor, honor the pe people that are your elders, you know, all the different things. I really wonder if that's, you know, what's going to happen in just a few years when, when our generation's getting older and moving on. The next generation doesn't seem to have the same kind of priorities we do. Just today I was thinking about that. But you know what? We don't have to worry about the gospel. God is very capable of protecting his gospel. It's his gospel. We just need to present it. We need to be out there praying for this nation, this culture, like never before. And leave the results to him, not worry about what we're up against. Remember, we've been talking lately about our weapons. Though we live in the world, we do not fight as the world does, right? Our weapons have divine nature to tear down strongholds. And, man, we see a stronghold going on right here in Rome, and right in the middle of it, the church is flourishing. I just thought, I won't take time to look up all these, these uh, references here, but I just thought of several biblical concepts that's being demonstrated right here with this church in Rome. One is, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, right? Where, how about the, the concept of where grace or where sin does abound, grace does that much more abound, right? How about being in the world but not of it? That was going on right there in the church of Rome. Uh, the, what I just said, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. We have divine weapons to tear down strongholds. Man, they were tearing down strongholds there, I bet, in that church in uh, that area of Rome. So, I mean, they were right in the middle of it, and the very persecution they faced was far greater, by the way, than what we're facing today. I believe that what they were facing today was greater than mask mandates <laughs> and vaccine mandates and all the things that are freaking us out and dividing us as a culture, even in the church. You know, I think this church was dealing with a little bit more dire situation than that, Right? Yet, we see the church explode. In fact, one historian said that the early Christians there in Rome were considered by the Roman government as enemies of the human race. Literally, they were called that. And it was this kind of sentiment that, that led to many of them being martyred by Nero later on. We know the story. We've heard that through history. He had a major part of Rome burned, and then blamed the Christians for it. But again, we also have to remember that this very persecution that was being served up by the enemy caused a church to explode. So, guys, what, I'm, what am I building up to here is that we got to remember that God always wins. And we also have to remember this, that we are on the winning team. Can we say both of those nice and loud? First of all, God always wins. God always wins. Secondly, we are on the winning team. Man, we got to remember that. So let's pick it up again. Verse, verse 9, Paul says, God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So again, he's stating that he hadn't been there yet but he was looking forward to being there with him, right? And now notice in verse 11. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. This is interesting to me. Remember, I said the book of Romans is chock full of good Christian doctrine. Here's Paul Again, whom we consider to be, you know, a spiritual superstar, as it were. A superior in terms of intellect, training, qualifications, all that. 
But yet his desire was to strengthen them. And that's, that's, what, that's what drove him. So I just, I just have to stop and ask myself, do I strive to strengthen others? Do I strive to build them up? <laughs> do I, what, what, what comes out of my mouth on an average day? Is it, is it just to build people up or does, do I tear people down? And here's a biblical concept. Here's a good doctrinal concept. We should always strive to build others up, not tear them down. That's what Paul's desire was. We should always strive to build others up, not tear them down. Remember, I, you know, there's a couple of annoying sayings that I say periodically. One of them is, you rarely have to apologize for what you don't say. <laughs> you don't have to say what you're thinking. <laughs> Newsflash for some of us. Man, some of us just open our mouth and it just escapes like a flock of doves, you know? And it's like we try to grab it and shove it back in. It's too late, man. It's like squeezing a toothpaste. He wants the toothpaste to the squeeze. He can't get it back in. But our desire should be to build people up. We need to learn how to get control of that tongue. Can't think of any scripture that puts it better than Ephesians 4.29 that says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Wow. What strife could we save at our homes, at our behind closed doors, in our marriages, if we both if both spouses strived to do just that. It said, it said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That sounds pretty cut and dry. It didn't say don't let much, unless you're really angry, unless that person really deserved it, unless they're, they're being snarky towards you, unless the dukes are up, right? It's when, it's when guys, we want, it's when those dukes are up that we need to, as believers, as Christians, we need to get control of that and you can say something. It may feel very mechanical in the beginning, but you can say, okay, wait a minute. I'm escalating. This whole conversation is escalating. We need to stop right now. Never argue when you're angry. It'll only, it's, it's only divisive. It, it's rarely productive. Say, it's, it's escalating. I, I'm going to stop right now. We'll talk about this later when we've cooled off. Then you pray. <laughs> what a concept, praying instead of arguing. And then you pray for a time. This is what, I'm, tell me, I'm, I'm telling you, this is practical, and this is good Christian doctrine here. Pray, God will take you up on this. I do it, and he does. God, whew, I, I feel this way. Show me how I really should feel in this. God, can, do I even have a right to be offended here? Just let the dust settle, Lord. And God, if we are supposed to take this further and talk about it again, orchestrate a time. Your will be done in this. I'm telling you, I'm, this is real. This is practical. This is real. He will take you up. So in essence, what did you just do? I said this is good Christian doctrine. In essence, you did what it says in Proverbs 3. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What does that mean? I invite you into the situation. <laughs> what if you invited God in to the situation when you were arguing with your spouse. I'm just saying, oh boy. God, help me, help us. We invite you in, Lord. Help me to see clearly in this. If there's anything to talk about further in this, Lord, orchestrate a time, and I'm telling you, he will take you up on it. It may be a half a day, it may be the next day, it may be a week later, it may be two weeks later, but when he does it, his time is always best, and it will be productive. You catch a lot more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. You get what I'm saying? Okay, that's practical. You know, this is good, this is good practical stuff. Now let's get back to Romans here. Notice, then notice he says that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. What? These are new believers. But yet Paul is saying that he's going to be encouraged by their faith. <laughs> Did you notice that? 
It's mutual. He says mutual. So check this out. Did you know that when you build someone up, it builds you up at the same time? You better believe it does. Every time I encourage someone, every time I help someone, man, I, 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 have, my, I have my share of, of guys that I mentor and counsel and talk with, and <clears throat> I always pray, God, give me something, Lord. I never want to say anything that's just me, God. Get me out of the way, Lord. I only want to speak the words that you want to speak. Give me discernment. Open my eyes. Let me open my ears so that I can see and glorify you in this. And then when I'm able to say something that helps that person, I don't know if they're blessed, but I am. It blesses me. What, how does it bless me? Well, for one thing, it tells me that God's using me. And it tells me that I'm his. That tells me my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's what Jesus told his disciples to rejoice over. <laughs> Not all that other stuff. I'm his. He speaks and I hear. Everything else is gravy. You get what I'm saying? He speaks. I hear. What do I have to worry about? <laughs> you better believe it blesses me. But I've also noticed, like for instance, on Monday nights here, we give our testimony at Celebrate Recovery. And I say this often. In fact, every time there's a testimony, I usually introduce a person and I pray for them. And I pray this, God, I pray as they give their testimony that they would be blessed as they bless others. Did you know in the book of Romans, I won't take time to, I'm sorry, not Romans, but Revelation. I won't take time to look it up. But it says that we overcome by the what? The blood of the lamb and what? The word of our testimony. We overcome. It doesn't say others overcome by the word. Who overcomes by the word of my testimony? He. Every time I give it, I overcome a little bit. You better believe it blesses me when I bless others. So Paul indeed was wanting to be mutually blessed by seeing these young Christians flourishing. And as he's blessing them, they're blessing him back. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what community is all about, by the way. Next, in verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have among the other Gentiles. We went over this <clears throat> in our recent study of the book of Acts. We asked, did God really prevent him from going places in his ministry? I mean, I thought the whole world was supposed to hear the gospel, right? I mean, just let it rip, man. Go wherever, right? Would God really stop him? You better believe it. Let's take a look. One example, just one. Acts 16, 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of uh, Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Wow. What's that about? Well, in that case, I'll just tell you that that was because it was God's will for him to go to Macedonia first. But, you know, Paul was like, hey, man, let's go. I want to go to Asia, man, let's go. Um, and so he went to, the Holy Spirit stopped him, and he went to Macedonia. And by the way, what do we get out of that? Well, we get the story of Lydia, <laughs> the dealer of fine garments, being converted, her whole household being converted. We get the story of Paul and Silas in the prison out of that. We would have missed all of that if, if the Holy Spirit just let Paul do what he wanted. I mean, I love that story about Paul and Silas. They were here in the, in the prison. they have just been beaten, remember? And here they are in prison at midnight doing what? What were they doing? Singing and praising God. <laughs> and what happened? The earth shook, and the jail was shaken, and the doors were, open, were flew open. And the, remember that's just that awesome, that awesome story, man. The jailer freaking out, you know, oh man, you know, I'm going to get beheaded because somebody escaped on my watch. And he comes in, and there, and Paul and Silas are still there. What happens? The jailer and his whole household they get saved <laughs> and baptized. So all of that would have we would have missed all of that if the Holy Spirit would have 
let Paul just go wherever. See, it's God's will, guys. We've got to remember, it's always important to submit our will to God's. That's some other good doctrine there. Good, solid doctrine there. It's always important to submit our will to God. I, now, you know, I don't think God holds it against us. If we, in our zeal, we, you know, we want to go out there and do this. We want to save the world and go save everybody and all that and, and, um, and all that. But, but we should always pray, God, this is what I want to do. What's your will? What's your will, Lord? James addresses that issue quite well. In James 4, he says, now listen, you who say to today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. <laughs> what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a while, a little while, and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that's good, solid doctrine. And James is chock also full of good, solid doctrine. I mean, James has been said to be like a, a, just a, a working document on how to live a life, Christian life. So God always has reasons for what he does. That's the point I'm trying to make here. We often don't know what those are until later, but we will always see his hand in it, so we should always submit our will to, to God. Uh, it says here in Isaiah 55, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways or your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, that's good to remember, right? So we, it's good to submit to God's will. He, his, his thoughts are higher than ours anyway. Now, in verse 14, did someone have their hand up? Mike? Okay. Okay. In verse 14, let's get back. It says, Paul, Paul says uh, in verse 14, I am, for I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is faith, that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So there's so much here in this last section. Um, let's start with verse 14. Take a look at that again. It says, For I am obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and and to the foolish, that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. So clearly, Paul was ready to preach the gospel to anyone who would listen. It didn't matter, Greek, non-Greek, Jew, Gentile. The Roman church was mostly Gentiles. We just established that, right? But it didn't matter to Paul, who was a Jew, because his obligation was what? To the gospel. Yes, absolutely. He says, I am obligated. His obligation was to the gospel. It reminds me of what he said later when he used the word obligation again in Romans 8. Check this out. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he, has, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Get this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have a, an what? Obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So Paul talks a lot about this idea of obligation. We're not obligated to the old ways. We're not obligated to our bodies. We're not obligated to the flesh. I mean, this bag of bones that we walk around in, this just carbon substrate, it just, it'll do what we say. It, it, it'll do what we tell it. We think sometimes the body's in control, but really our mind is what controls the body. That's why we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that's why Paul said, and later on we'll get to that in Romans 12, where he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your what? Bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And then later he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, those are the two areas, our body and our mind. Those are what? What's another word that starts with F, that kind of, uh, the flesh, we are left here on earth. When we were saved, 
I would have liked it if I just got saved and just got zapped up into heaven. But he left us here. In fact, Jesus prayed that in John 17. I'm not praying that you would take them uh, from here, but to, uh, but to protect them from the evil one. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Set them apart, he's saying. They need to stay here because they need to spread the gospel. So I'm not obligated since I have since I have been saved in a spiritual sense, my spirit man was saved the moment I believed, but now I'm left on this earth to get control of this body and this mind. <laughs> right? We got to get it into our noggins here and into our spirit. I am not obligated to my thoughts. Hello. I'm not obligated to what I want to say. I'm not obligated to my emotions. Uh, Wow, that's a, that is a concept. I'm not obligated to how the rage that I feel. I'm not obligated to say what I think. I'm supposed to glorify God with my speech, my body, my mind, everything. <laughs> that's what Paul is saying. I'm obligated now to him. All Paul was concerned about was the gospel. And here he says to the Roman church later, hey, you have an obligation, all right, but it is not to those old things. I mean, the Roman culture must have just celebrated debauchery and all the lavishness of, 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 of everything that was just there for them. The, the, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and all of that. I mean, it was just right there on full display, right? He said, hey, you're not obligated to that anymore. Now we're obligated to a different thing. In Romans 8, he said we're obligated to the Spirit, to live by the Spirit and put to, to, to death the misdeeds of the body. And here he's saying, I'm obligated to the gospel. That should be the main thing. We're supposed to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> we got to get it. Again, guys, i got to say this is such an important, this is important doctrine right here. When we, be, when we become believers as we're maturing in Christ, we have to get it. We are not obligated I remember that 24 years ago. I remember that just that light coming on that just because I felt like I had to drink doesn't mean I have to drink. <laughs> I'm not obligated to that anymore. It no longer calls the shots in my life. I'm no longer obligated to that flesh. Amen. I'm obligated to, to the gospel, to live the gospel, and Paul was obligated to preach that gospel. He said to Timothy... Check this out. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So that, be, that, that, that phrase, in season and out of season, you know what that tells me? Be ready. Be ready at all times. Be filled with the Spirit and be ready because God could bring somebody you never know. Man, those God opportunities that just come along, you're going to miss them if you're not in the Spirit. If you're in the flesh, you'll miss it. Guarantee it. So that's what I think that's the spirit of that, what Paul is saying. Now let's get back to Romans 1 on verse, in verse 16. Paul goes on, he says, the famous words, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is a power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile, for in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith, man, that's, such, that's rich doctrine right there. You could preach a sermon series on just those few verses right there. Remember, guys, as we read the Bible with intentionality, we consider the setting. Paul is writing to the Roman church located in the capital of the Roman Empire where all the pomp, lavishness, indulgence of the Roman culture was on full display. This was surely an arrogant culture that looked down on other cultures, it would have been easy, I think, for a Christian to feel timid about a religion where its Messiah came in meekness and died a criminal's death on the cross. But Paul went right after it and said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Are we ashamed of the gospel? I mean, we may not blatantly show shame, but are we free to tell others about it? Or are we sometimes embarrassed? Yeah, I don't want to come on. I don't want to come on. 
I don't want to be a fanatic, right? I don't care anymore. Man, I just, hey, Jesus loves you, man. Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for your life. Man, I tell people that. Sometimes I just walk up. I mean, that's just one of the things. I, I work downtown in, in Fresno, and I'm walking around, and I oftentimes see people that, are, that look really lost, and sometimes they're homeless or whatever, and I'll walk up, and I just sometimes I'll feel really compelled to say this. Jesus knows exactly where you are. He knows your name. He has a plan for your life. He loves you. You know, I don't care. I don't care what they think of me. Right? Did you know that Jesus, these are some challenging words here that Jesus said. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. Man, that kind of scares me right there. Also, if I had time, I'd take you into Hebrews where it says, both the one who makes men holy and those he makes holy are of the same family. Therefore, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. <laughs> He's not ashamed of me. I'm not ashamed of him. I'm here because of him. I'm convinced that I'm alive because of him. I should have been dead over and over. So now notice what Paul says. We'll keep on rolling here. We're wrapping up for tonight. He says, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Guys, the gospel is the power that brings salvation, period. Period. That's freeing for us. That means you don't have to worry about embellishing it. Well, you know, I need to talk like so-and-so. No, you don't. No, you don't. I, I got over that really early in my ministry because I would go over to events at our state headquarters and see these guys come in that are big-time preachers. We used to have a state overseer that could, I can, I can quote scripture. I, I have quite a bit of scripture memorized, but, you know, honestly, it's usually three, four, five verses, you know, chunks that I memorize. This guy memorizes books of the Bible. I mean, he literally doesn't use notes. He would get up and literally preach for 45 minutes and not have a single note. And he would quote scripture, scripture after scripture after scripture in it. I'd sit there, got so intimidated by that. I thought, man, what in the world do I have? I can't even compete with that. I realized real quick, I don't have to compete with that. I'm not him. He's not me. It's the gospel that's the power that brings salvation. <laughs> I mean, look at Billy Graham. That guy, I mean... The whole world respects Billy Graham. You think of a man that has been responsible for millions of people, millions of people coming to Christ. And you listen, have you ever watched one of his minute, one of his messages? I mean, it wasn't it wasn't uh, chock full of real depth. You know, it was basically he just put it out there. You know, you're a sinner, you need to repent. You know, but there was power in his message. Why? Because there is power. The gospel is the power that brings salvation. He was just a faithful servant. Now, I'm probably selling him short. I know he, he studied the Bible. He was really, really, really good at what he did. But what did he do? He just brought a simple gospel message. It's the power that brings salvation. Now, that's me off the hook. I don't have to be all fancy with my speech. I just have to live and speak the gospel. Nothing else can save us. And now notice he says a curious statement. First for the Jew, to the Jew, then to the Gentile. What does that mean? Does that shake anybody up? It shook me up early in my, in my uh, walk with the Lord when I really started diving in and studying the Word, especially when you consider what he said in Romans 2. We'll get to that probably very soon. For God does not show favoritism. <laughs> so what, how do you measure those two up against each other? What's going on? Is it a contradiction? It is simply this, guys. It was God's intent that the world be evangelized through the Jewish nation. It is simply that. That was his intent. The Jews were his chosen nation. Why? Because he chose favoritism? No. He loved the whole world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish. He loved us all, but he chose the Jews to get the gospel message out. That's how it was. That's what his intent was. 
However, as we know, they didn't quite catch on to that plan, did they? Look what it says in John 1. He, he being Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. This is in reference to the Jews. But his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, that's us, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a human or a husband's will, but born of God. That's us. So that's what it was about. That's what that means. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Don't get too shaken up about that. That's what that means. Then Paul completes the statement in Romans 1 by explaining the gospel in one sentence. This is awesome. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That is it in one concise statement. Faith to all who did receive him, to who, those that believed in his name, right? The gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Again, what's the gospel? It's the story of Jesus, right? It's the good news. Jesus died for your sins. In that, the righteousness of God is revealed. What does that mean? The righteousness, the right standing of God, well, okay, not sure. How, how does that work, Pastor? I, okay, I, I mean, that sounds like a lot of church speak here. How is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel? Well, the righteousness of God is means the justice, the uh, the uh, the justice. He's a, he's a just God also. He's righteous in that, in that he's without sin. He's pure. He's holy. And a holy God can't look on sin. And so the righteousness of God was revealed in the gospel in that he sent his one and only son. He who was without sin was sent to become sin on our behalf so that the price could be paid, so that it could be paid in full because God is indeed a righteous and just God. Otherwise, we, you and I, would still be trying to appease his anger somehow. That's how it was revealed. That's, the, that's why it's called good news. You don't have to strive anymore. To those who believed and received, God gave the right to become children of God. Do you get what I'm saying? That's awesome there. That's why I love that. In, seven, in verse 17, it just encapsulates the whole gospel message in one concise statement. It's all about faith. So again, the statement is true. The salvation story is indeed all about faith. He says in Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's not about us, man. It's nothing we brought to the table. This means that I didn't do anything. It's not my knowledge or it's my, not my good behavior or, or even the promises that I make to God. It is faith. What is faith? I mean, we could talk about that for a while, but I want to just lay a couple of easy, I think, basic concepts about faith. I want to lay them on you right now. First of all, faith is simply taking God at his word. That's it. God said it, I believe it, that's it. To those who believe and those that receive, you're in. It's, it's, it's realizing God said it. Well, that, that sounds too easy. Well, you know what? Faith says, okay, well, it may be too, it's too easy, but I believe it. Simply taking God at his word. And his word says this, by the way, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, there's that believe again, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, for those of you that are watching and you don't know where you stand with the Lord right now, it would be a great time to settle the matter. It's just that simple. I just laid it out to you. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel story. God is a just God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin means death. So, unless something else happens, we're going to die because of our sin. We deserve to die because of our sin. However, he did come up with a good remedy by sending the one who was without sin, he became sin. I mean, he literally became sin. He took our sins on him. 
And in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before, the, the stress of it all was so heavy that it caused his sweat glands and, uh, and, and all of his skin to just break out and started bleeding. He started sweating blood because of this internal stress of all of our sins being put on him. And he said, I, be, I believe that that's when he began to feel that separation from his father there in that garden. And that's why the anguish of it all was hitting him in his humanity. But yet the Bible says that he took that cup willingly and he drank it all. Why? For me and for you. That's the gospel story. So that God's wrath could be satisfied once and for all so that we could go from death to life, so that we could say, death, oh, where is your sting? Because no longer, uh, that we, that we, I mean, before, when, when the grave was going to be the end for us, now it's just the beginning. We have eternal life for those that believed in him, that no one would perish, but all would come to eternal life. That's a simple gospel story. So again, I say, if you're not sure where you stand with that right now, I want you to just look at what Romans 10, 9 says. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can settle that matter right now, once and for all. Let's just say it. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let's say it this way. Let's personalize it. Jesus is my Lord. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. Save me, Lord. Save me from my sins. Guys, that is how you do it. It's just that simple. And also, faith is a confident trust in God's power. I mean, I wish I had time to talk about Abraham. He had that faith that God had the power to do what he said he was going to do. It talks about that in the book of Romans, but it also talks about that in the book of Genesis. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He was considered a friend of God. Why? Because he believed God. He believed that he had the power to do what he said he was going to do. So if you just said that prayer, you better believe that God has the power to stop everything that he's doing, holding the entire universe in his hands. And he heard that call, that call you made to him. And just like that, your sins are washed away as far as the east is from the west. They were dumped in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. He has that power to do that. Praise God. And he has the power to do what he said he's going to do in our lives. We are standing on a lot of promises right now in this church, and I believe that God has the power to do every one of them. Amen? We'll see healings. We're going to see a deliverance. We're going to see restored marriages and families, and we're going to see this church full of people hungry for the Lord. I believe it. Because God has the power to do it. I have that faith. I hope you do too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. Oh, hallelujah, Father, what a great study. Just, I, I, I can just tell this book of Romans is just going to be a doozy. Uh, we, we haven't even finished chapter 1 yet. And God, we're already being blessed tremendously. I just pray for each person. I pray for those that may have said that prayer at the end there. And, and God, I know that all of heaven right now is rejoicing because of it. I pray, God, right now that you would just uh, put a hedge of protection around them. I pray, God, that, um, that we, God, would wake up and see that we are your children because we have believed and received. And all of these promises are ours. I pray that for the new believer. I pray that for the longtime believer, Lord. Refresh us, God. May we be refreshed as, as new, Lord, in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Love you.